What is your favorite passage in the Bible? You don't have to say it out loud. I have a true confession. I have a few. I don't even know if you're allowed to have a few. Are you, are you allowed to? I mean, as a follower of Jesus, I, I kind of think you are. Different texts land on us in certain ways, depending on what's going on. If you're a golfer, you've heard this expression, this course really fits my eye, right? You've heard that expression? Do you know any bill that, that fit our eye? Yeah, uh, for amateur golfers, probably not the case. But there are just some texts that do fit our eye. Now, sadly, they're often the ones that are just about God blessing us and everything's going well and his favor and so on. We're, we're not, we don't really have a lot of favors to talk about God's suffering that's going to come into our life in hard times. But I have a number of kind of like top five texts. Uh, one that, that readily comes to mind is when I was 18 years old, I was wrestling with did that six and a half year old kid that I was who believed in Jesus, did he really know what he was doing? Did he really have Almighty God, the Spirit of God, come into his life? And I was wrestling with that. And God brought 1 John 5 to life for me. That I was secure in Christ and I, I knew it and I had eternal security in Christ. Assurance of salvation. And I've often said that it's the blood of Christ that makes us safe. It's the word of God that makes us sure. And at that point, I was so sure, and that's been just a, a favorite text of mine. Well, right up at the top of, of my top five list would be Acts chapter 12. You say, why? Well, I'll give you three reasons. One reason would be just the storytelling and how it gripped me at, at a certain point in my life. Uh, before Karen and I were, were married, Karen was a nurse. And uh, she was working at Guelph General, but she was also an assistant for an oral surgeon in Guelph. And we became really good friends with Dr. Chuck and his wife, Nina. Uh, such good friends that we often babysat their three kids at their farm. And um, after we were married, we did it quite a bit. And actually, we would stay like weekends at a time with their kids. And for two summers, I was their, their yard manager. I, I cut their lawn and they had this huge, huge, huge lawn. I literally sat on a riding lawnmower for three days of the week cutting their grass. And uh, as a 20, 21 year old, I was in sales at the time. And uh, so I would have a Walkman with a cassette player. Some of you young people have heard of these things. And I would have it on at full volume so I could hear it over the tractor. Okay, I fault my hearing loss to this day from those two summers when my prefrontal cortex had not yet been developed and I made such a dumb decision. But on break times, I would, I would lie in a hammock and read my Bible. And I remember the second summer going through the book of Acts. It was like I'd never read it before. The narrative, the storytelling was just alive to me. It was so exciting. And I remember getting to Acts chapter 12 and thinking, a guy was eaten by worms? Is this real? Is there a movie about this? Is someone going to make a movie? I want to see this movie. But I remember just how gripping the book of Acts became to me during that time. Secondly, I've always enjoyed the humor that is in Acts chapter 12. Now, we just read it. And you might think, well, there's a little bit of humor. There's a lot of humor. The whole angel with Peter thing, he struck him. Very serious word. Probably kicked him to wake him up. And then told him to get dressed the way a parent would tell a child to get dressed. We'll, we'll get there. You'll see the, the subtleties when, when we study it. And then the whole thing with Rhoda. Right? Peter's at the door. Rhoda's like, I, I'm going to go tell them that, you know, that, that you're here, and, and they say it's his ghost. I mean, we're praying that he's alive, but he's obviously not alive. And there's just a lot of subtlety and humor. And even, even Peter, he's like standing at the door saying, I can break out of prison er, easier than I can break into a prayer meeting. What is up with this, right? There's just a lot of humor. But I'll tell you, the biggest reason this chapter has been so meaningful is how deeply... God has used this chapter in my life to this day. Uh, I was about 25 or 26, and our brother-in-law, Stu, gave me a call one day, and he said, Gord, there is a very famous uh, United Kingdom preacher 
named Jack Hunter from Scotland, who's coming over to Ontario, and he is scheduled to speak 24 nights in a row in 24 different churches. Do you want to come with me to a few of those? <laughs> and I remember at the time, I was like, Scottish preacher? Say no more. I was like, yes, I love that Scottish brogue. I just want to hear that. And so I was in. On my hand, I don't think I can count how many sermons that I've heard in my lifetime where I could say, I know who spoke, I know what passage they spoke on, and I know what, know what, knew what church it was in. But this one I can't. It was a church on Eglinton Avenue in Toronto. It was Acts chapter 12. It was Jack Hunter from Scotland. The chapter asks some very penetrating questions. And in honor of hearing Jack Hunter preach that, I'm going to preach the rest of the message in a Scottish accent. Are you, are you okay with that? There would be about three or four of you who would be okay with that, and you'd be the only ones left in your seats at the end of the message. I know that, so I won't do that. But why, why, why is James taken, and he's one of the inner three of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Why is he taken and murdered? Why did God permit that to happen? And, and don't people who are disciples of Jesus and leaders in that whole movement, as James was, don't they get a pass? But then, why is Peter taken, and he too is to be executed, but he is delivered and rescued? Did Jesus love Peter more than he loved James? They're the big three, Peter, James, and John. Why James? Why Peter? And then, why would Herod, a very evil, wicked individual, have so much authority over these people who are the authorities in the church, does he have greater authority than the authority of God that he could dispatch one into eternity? And then we read how the chapter ends. Why does Herod get his and die such a horrible death by being eaten by worms? And I can still hear Jack Hunter saying, there is only one answer, that's the sovereignty of God. The sovereign government of God. What does that mean? What does that mean? If, if you were to take, if, if you just look on the screen, if you were to take the S off and take the T-Y off, what do you see in there? You see over reign. The sovereignty of God is the over reign of God. Well, here's, here's a dictionary definition. It means the supremacy of or authority, a supremacy of authority or rule exercised by a sovereign. It also means royal rank, royal authority, royal power. It means complete independence and self-government. The government of God, the over reign of God. Why does God deserve to be sovereign? Well, because... He's God. Right? He, he is all powerful. No other being is. He is all knowing. No other being is. He is everywhere present. No other being is. And he is eternal. No other being is. Those are the attributes of God. And so he is sovereign. Like just his all knowing ability he, his thoughts are greater than ours and i thought how can i say this god's weakest thought if there was ever such a thing god's weakest thought is exponentially higher than all of our collective greatest human thoughts put together you say did you just make that up no i'm actually following the lead of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1.25, he says, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God, he must have put it in parentheses, is stronger than human strength. When God says, I will, 
nothing stands in his way. Nothing. When Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevent it. Nothing will prevent it. I will. And God, here's the other part of God's sovereignty. God does not have to consult with me about his plans. Imagine that. God does not have to consult with you or with me about his plans. Now, where does evil factor into all of this? There's natural evil. We did a series this, this past spring all, all about this. So natural evil and, and moral evil. There's spiritual evil. There's human evil in the world. It all factors into our lives. But God is sovereign over all of these as well. And still he does not need to consult with you and I about his plans. The sovereign government of God. I would need to know that and believe that in my life. And I honestly believe that that's why God taught me this when I was in my mid-twenties. All of us have heard of 9-11. We know what happened in 9-11. The Twin Towers came down. When you ask people what year was that, some people know, some people don't know as readily. I will always remember as 2001 because that was the year that my Twin Towers came down in my life. In the March of that year, my dad died in his sleep. Six months later, my second Twin Tower, my mom, had a massive stroke that left her personality forever changed for the last 18 years of her life until she passed a few years ago. And I grieved, and I lamented, and I sorrowed, but the sovereignty of God was like my, my north star. It was my true north. That God, you are in charge and you, you reign even in this situation of, of taking my dad home and my mom being debilitated the way she was. You are sovereign. Both, I, I have two siblings only. Both of my sisters have gone through significant heartache in their lives. I won't tell her that story, but significant heartache that the sovereignty of God has gotten us through what they have gone through. Karen's dad, who is a patriarch, a spiritual leader in our family, went home in 2019. Her mom, earlier just this year, again, grieving the sovereignty of God. And as many of you know, the biggest one for us was for 20 years, Karen and I lived with Karen having a brain tumor that grew to the point that last year in August, a year ago now, she had to have surgery to have it removed. And when they analyzed it, there was a diagnosis of cancer. And then as some of you know, we then, Karen went to Wales and a month later, year ago, September, she had to have a second emergency surgery to save her life because of an infection. The sovereign government of God, it meant everything as we went through those moments. And, and it's not only the things in our life, it is the things in the lives of the precious people that God has called us to journey with. And I could just name so many people in so many circumstances, but I think of my friends from Eritrea. Just since Grace and Radiant have been together, together in this, this, this time of discovery, of emerging, we, we've met so many precious Eritrean people. And to think of what the people, especially from Tigray, are going through at this moment, only the sovereignty of God is making any kind of sense of it. This is from Friday. I'm going to show you a very brief clip. It's from the World Health Organization's Director General from just two days ago. Look at this. The humanitarian crisis in Tigray is more than Ukraine. Without any exaggeration. And I said it many months ago. Maybe the reason is the color of the skin of the people in Tigray. 
I haven't heard in the last five few months or several months now even a head of state talking about the Tigray condition anywhere in the developed world especially. Why? I think we know. The only thing we're asking is can the world come back to its senses and uphold humanity? If it's the worst humanitarian crisis and I'm saying Nowhere on earth six million people are sealed off. Nowhere. From basic services, from their own money, from telecom, from food, from medicine. This is the worst disaster on earth as we speak. I am from, from Tigray. It's not because from I am from Tigray that I'm saying this. That's the truth. living example right now in our world of spiritual and moral evil and our hearts break and should break over this is this under the sovereignty of God it is in God's sovereignty there is still direction in his permission that allows that the collective consequence of human sin to play the tape out to the end sometimes, and that's what's happening in Tigray right now. Against God's original design and plan, humanity turned its back on God, and sometimes these are the kind of consequences that people caught in the crossfire experience. It's horrible. And apart from the intervention of God, and apart from the intervention of people that God inspires to intervene, believe it or not, things would be much worse in this world and in your life and mine. And, and may, may I say this, and I really want you to hear this, this does not mean that we do not sit with God, ideally, with God in our lament. That we sit with God in our confusion, even in our rage and anger, I was so grateful that that question got asked of Pablo this past Wednesday night. Pablo, are you angry about what Russian people have done in Ukraine? And this Ukrainian pastor said, yes, I have raged and I have been angry. And for those who are here, you, you may remember he said, you know, what, what has helped me to think about it is that they're really puppets, puppets of this propaganda machine in Russia, but he says, I also know it wasn't Putin who did the horrific things, and he named them in Bucha and Erbin. It was, it was human beings who did that. And so only looking at these people, looking at Russians the way God looks at them, the way Jesus looks at them, is giving him any kind of peace in this moment. Yes, we, we sit with God until his grace works into the situation and begins to heal us. But knowing the sovereignty of God is a catalyst for those things to happen. Here are a couple of big questions, if you look on the screen, about the sovereignty of God that this text raises. What is the role of human will? And what is the role of prayer? Because here's the church. Presumably they prayed for James. We're not told that. Maybe it caught them by surprise. But they're certainly doubling down and praying for Peter. But what is the role of that in the sovereignty of God? We have seen before from, from, from other you know, Bible studies that God's plan often unfolds through our prayers. I don't know about you, but Karen and I have talked about this a lot lately. The older we get, the yes answers to prayer. That list keeps getting longer, which is wonderful. The list of, you know, prayers that get answered with a yes is getting longer and longer. But the list where the answer is no is still quite a bit longer. <laughs> quite a bit longer. You and I have prayed for people struggling in life, right? We've prayed for people with struggling marriages. We've prayed for people with, with faltering businesses, with, with failing health. We've prayed about people who are talking about moving out of our lives. Or sorry, moving into our lives. We hear, hear about this person or this couple who's going to maybe move this way. And the answer has been yes. Right? And God has healed marriages and God has healed like businesses and health. And, and 
And what do we say? We say, praise God and God is good. God is good, right? God is good. But I've prayed for more people who are struggling in their lives and for struggling marriages and businesses and health and about people, no, God, please, may they not move out of our lives. Greg and Deborah Hickey are here today from way up north. Thank you for visiting, but we haven't seen you in years. And, and they've moved out of our lives. Why? Well, first of all, is God still good? Yes. Why don't we say that? God, you're good. And praise God. Because he still is. But why in the sovereignty of God does he say no? It's still an answer. It's not like he doesn't answer our prayer. Yes and no are answers. But sometimes the no is because I have a better plan than you even know. And I don't owe you an explanation. And will you simply bow to that? The sovereignty of God. Psalm 57, verse 2, is, is David praying. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills notice. His purposes, not my purposes, his purposes for me. Job, have you read the story of Job? Have you read the story of Job? If you have not, you need to read it. But he says, I know, God, that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. David and Job prayed. They believed in God's ability to do the things they prayed about. But even if it was a no, in the sovereignty of God, that he rules and he overrules in the affairs of humans. And they accepted him, the sovereignty of God. Uh, listen, this, this even carries into any issue that you can name that you've wrestled with in your life. Think of philosophical issues or social issues that are going on right now in our culture. And you've wrestled with them. Which way should I lean on this? And, and just life experiences. Listen, the sovereignty of God is a massive piece toward gaining clarity and having peace about that issue. That God is sovereign, that he is the creator, the designer, the authority, and we are not. Is a huge part of the equation in all of these issues. The fact that human hearts, my heart, your heart, cannot be trusted. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The human heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In the sovereignty of God, we had a technical issue and we lost a few minutes of the message this morning, so I'm going to include that now. All of this to this point in the message has been the introduction to the chapter. We're in chapter 12 of Acts, and I've entitled this God's Sovereignty Part 1. We'll try and conclude uh, the rest of the chapter next week. But I've been praying for us that, that we will have a greater grasp of the sovereignty of God, that you and I will delight in the truth of it. Uh, let's get to the text. Verse 1 begins like this. It was about this time. What time? Well, the time of these events, um, it's kind of hard to believe, but by the time we get to Acts 12, it's not months since the resurrection of Jesus. It's 15 years since uh, Jesus was on the earth. So it's quite a time span. And we had a time stamp at the end of the last chapter that talked about a worldwide famine. And so it was at about this time of the worldwide famine, 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus, that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. Who is this King Herod? Well, you might notice something consistent both in the Bible and in history about names such as Haman, Herod, Hitler, H names for guys are never good. If you're about to have a baby boy, you might want to avoid uh, a name that begins with H. Well, well Harry accepted. Uh, our Zoom host today is Harry, and he's a good guy, so that would be a good name. But actually, Herod was probably not a birth name that the parents would, would have given their son. Uh, it's rather a title, just like the Caesars. 
the Herods uh, were given this title. So, so let's, in talking about this Herod here in Acts 12, let's talk about his grandfather. And that was Herod the Great. And why was he called Herod the Great? Because he called himself Herod the Great. And he was, in fact, a great builder, but he was a horrible person. This is the Herod that had all the baby boys two years and under at the time of the birth of Jesus put to death. It's called the Massacre of the Innocents. And in the sovereignty of God, that was our dog that just barked. Uh, Herod the Great had 10 wives. He killed several of them. Not likely because they burnt his toast or got his steak to him late for dinner. Uh, others would have done that. But simply because they looked at him the wrong way or said something uh, that, that offended him. He had many, many sons. He killed several of his sons. I came across the most fascinating statement. It said this, it was safer to be Herod the Great's pig than his son. <laughs> That's terrible. He was such a horrible individual, he knew that when he died, no one would mourn his death. So he rounded up prominent Christians, this is what history tells us, rounded up prominent Christians and ordered that they be executed when he died so that there would be mourning in the land because he knew there'd be none for him. That's how evil Grandpa Herod was. Herod the Great had a son named Herod Philip. Philip I, and he was married to a woman named Herodias. She so liked and wanted to, you know, uh, gain favor with, with father-in-law, she called herself Herodias. And so she then, though, divorced Philip and married another son, a brother to Philip, named Antipas. And John the Baptist called Antipas, Herod Antipas, out about that, and Herodias asked that he be executed, and he was. Antipas, Herod Antipas, he is the Herod that was on the throne who condemned Jesus to death. Well, there was yet another brother, Herod Aristobulus, and he had a son named Herod Agrippa I, and that's our boy in Acts 12. Did you follow that? So Herod the Great, Grandpa, is the Grandpa, uh, Herod Aristobulus, and then Herod Agrippa the first. There's going to be a Herod Agrippa the second that Paul is going to stand before in Acts 25. But just to make it really clear, can I call Herod Agrippa the first HA1? Okay? <laughs> so HA1, in history, I discovered he was a schoolboy friend of Claudius, who's now a Caesar in Rome. So that's probably how he got appointed. Uh, HA1's grandpa, Herod the Great, killed his own wife, so H.A. 1's grandma, and then proceeded to kill his son, so the wife's kid, Aristobulus, H.A. 1's dad. So grandma and dad get killed by grandpa. Why am I telling you all this? How much trauma and, and brokenness and evil is in this Herod Agrippa's DNA here in Acts 12? Well, here's how much. He takes the church to persecute them, and in verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now again, who is this James? M many of you know that Jesus' way of disciple-making was to actually call guys to journey with him in life. And a disciple was someone who followed Jesus, was being changed by Jesus, and was committed to the mission of Jesus. No different than we should be today. And so his method was to twig, take 12 guys, but then he had his, his inner three that I think he spent more time with. Scripture indicates Peter, James, and John. Well, James and John were literal blood brothers. Does anyone know their nickname? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Their WWE name, right? <laughs> Sons of Thunder. Okay, some of you know nothing about wrestling. All right. Um, <laughs> when, when I was... Like eight or nine years old, my cousin, John, uh, his grandma, not related to me though, his grandbaby, her name was, she loved wrestling. She did not know Jesus and she loved wrestling. And one night, we did not even really know where we were going. She took us up to the Collingwood Arena and we watched 
wrestling. And you, some of the older crowd are going to know these names. The feature event was a tag team between Haystack Calhoun and Whipper Billy Watson against the Love Brothers. Yeah, wow, right? Haystack Calhoun at the time weighed 601 pounds, hence the name Haystack. But athletic, like nobody's business. We were sitting, I confirmed with my cousin John yesterday, we were sitting in the second row ringside. The sweat section, as these huge human beings were hitting each other, we were in the sweat zone. I should be telling a therapist this story. I really should be. It was, it was, it was terrifying as an eight or nine year old. But why did I tell you that? Because the Love Brothers, it was so rigged, the Love Brothers won. There's no way they could have beat Haystack Cahoon and Whipper Billy Watson. I can still hear Grand Davy screaming at, at the, the ref. And, um, but, but the Love Brothers, they would have got beat by Sons of Thunder. Uh, yes. Right? The Sons of Thunder Brothers. You say, really? Yes, there's a story in Luke chapter 9 where they come back from witnessing out in the village where no one responded. And they said, Jesus, um, should we call down fire on that whole village and kill them? That's what the Sons of Thunder were all about. Can you imagine, like, have you ever discipled someone and you thought, man, we're not making progress. How do you think Jesus felt? <laughs> These guys want to rain down fire on people I love. Wow, Sons of Thunder. That's who James is. He's one of the inner three. Now, we read this story. Again, they were called in their maybe 20s. He's maybe in his mid-30s now. And we say, this is so sad that he went to heaven. Is it? Is it? Do, do you know that John outran Peter to the tomb? Remember that story? Well, John's brother James outran Peter home to heaven. That's how it is for a believer. He outran all the other disciples home to heaven. That's awesome. Why did God call him home? Because his ministry was done here. We have that example in Revelation with the two witnesses. And it says when they gave their testimony, they were then martyred. Why? Because their testimony was done. And God called them home. And I don't want to stay a minute longer than when my testimony is done. God calls me home. And for James, that was his story. He beat all the disciples home. In verse 3, when he, Herod, saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Herod uses high-profile Peter really just as a pawn for political expediency. Right? To gain favor with the Jewish people. You say, well, why would he? Well, here's why. Because he is ruling in Jerusalem and Judea as a Roman. The Jewish people do not like Romans. And so he's currying favor with them. But not only that. I read extra biblically that there was probably some sympathy with Herod Agrippa with the Jews. It is believed that Herod was circumcised and followed some of the Jewish practices. So there was a real sympathy and he wanted to gain their favor. And so he seizes Peter. And we love Peter, don't we? Peter is so real. We love Peter. This is Peter's last major scene in Acts. He is going to fade after this chapter. And the, the storyline will transition to Paul. Well, look what happens. We're just going to hit two more verses. After arresting him... He put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So do you get the picture? Sixteen guards assigned to Peter on shifts, four at a time. And reading the rest of the story, two of them were chained to Peter, one on either arm and leg probably, and two were sentries at the door. Okay, there's some humor here. What kind of a like dangerous criminal is Peter? We thought he was a fisherman. You know why they did this? Because Peter was slippery. He was slippery. In Acts chapter 5, he was presumably one of the apostles who was in prison and escaped. In Acts chapter 5. 
And notice he, he escaped at that time through an angel, likely the same angel. I think his name was Elias, the angel of espionage, espionage and escape. That was who, I don't know that, that's extra biblical guessing. <laughs> but even dead, even dead, they sometimes got away from the Romans. Think Jesus. So, so Jesus escaped the Romans, right? And the apostles were there. So, so that's why this, this really heavy-handed, like 16 soldiers. The penalty under Roman law was that if someone escaped, whatever sentence they were to receive, that's what you receive. So these guys took this extremely seriously. And Herod intended to bring them out for public trial after the Passover. How did he know that? Again, he was familiar with Jewish law. Very familiar. He knew it needed to be after the Passover. Last verse. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The church, it doesn't say, but the church worried. But the church petitioned. But the church wrote letters, but the church picketed, but the church got together and talked about it. No, it says the church prayed. They prayed. The church appealed to a higher power than Herod. They didn't appeal to Herod. They appealed to a higher power than Herod. The power of God's church is prayer. Do you believe that? Yes. We say we believe it. Do we believe it? Do our actions betray that we believe it? The church is not praying because it's all they can do. The church is praying because it's the best they can do. It is the best they can do. And notice, it's nighttime. Right? We, we already saw it. it's nighttime. They are praying through the night. Have you ever done that before? They're praying earnestly. And, and again, maybe James was taken and it caught the church off. Maybe they did not see it coming that James would be executed and our boy James has gone home to heaven. We need to start praying for our boy Peter because we can't afford to have another leader like Peter leave us. In fact, that word earnestly, ek tenos, without slack. That word means without slack, taught strenuously, fervently in prayer. Maybe our prayers are powerless because they're earnestlessness of our earnestlessness right they can be powerful when we're earnest um, I, I love this story it's a humorous story of a, 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 a pastor a priest and a rabbi and they're talking in a room about what is the best position to be in for God to hear you when you're praying and outside the door is an electrician working and he overhears this and the, the pastor says well the very best way is bowed head eyes closed and the priest says no eyes open hands raised and the rabbi says no on your face prostrate before God the electrician can't help it he walks in and he says I have never prayed any of those ways that you've suggested but I can tell you the best prayer I've ever given was hanging upside down from a power line when my harness broke. <laughs> Why? Because his back was against the wall. And we pray best when we're up against it, right? And that's where the church was. On Wednesday night, Pavlo told the incredible story of a bunch of Ukrainians that were hiding in a church basement in Ukraine and Russian soldiers came in and they were executing people in the village and they came in to take these people out and to execute them and I don't even know if these were church people or not but they started praying like out loud everyone just started praying and, and Pavlo said all that the commander did was he went and walked out wow in the sovereignty of God as they prayed but why does it take prisons to bring prayers why why does it take prisons to bring prayers? Here's the answer. The answer is we are self-sufficient until we realize we aren't. We are so self-sufficient until we realize that we aren't. We are not as sovereign over our own life experiences as we thought we were. Prayer should be the church's go-to about everything. 
In fact, if you look at the screen, the phrase that should follow every adverse situation should be, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Daniel lost his job, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Aaron and Adrian's car went up in smoke, but the church was earnestly praying for them. Linda still has cancer in her body, but the church was earnestly praying for her. Individually, a marriage is struggling, maybe in free fall, but the church was earnestly praying for them. A child is struggling, maybe has lost the ability to self-govern, but the church was earnestly praying for that child. This church merger is the church earnestly praying about it. Maybe this merger needs much, much less chatter horizontally and a whole lot more chatter vertically. Will prayer change a sovereign God's mind? And the answer is no. But will prayer 99 times out of 100 be a part of a sovereign God's unfolding plan? Yes. Because all through scripture, where you see prayer, you see God's unfolding plan go a certain way. That prayer was a part of God's sovereign plan. Without it, how to think, like see, we don't know that. We don't have the veil pulled back and we do not know. But here's what we do know. We need to pray. Let's do that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, you are God who against all odds has allowed us to experience your sovereignty in sending your son Jesus. God, there is no place in this universe or in this world where there was justice in Jesus being sent to a cross and being executed for, for sins that were not his. But God, we thank you that in your sovereignty, you directed your permission for that to happen. And today, God, we are the recipients of that grace. And if there's anyone here today who has not embraced this, this truth, this hard truth of the sovereignty of God, Father, would their first step be receiving this sovereign king who died on the cross for them? And Lord, for those of us who do know him, may we declare today, Jesus, you are Lord. And you are sovereign over our lives. And we bow to you as the sovereign God. Give direction in your permission to all that happens in our lives. And we will say that you are good. Because you are. Thank you for this time together and for your word that is so alive. Father, may it perform whatever you have sent it for this day. In Jesus' name.